Mrs. Sippel for the S&D. Thank you very much, and thank you, Mr. Skinas, for being here. I carefully listened to you, and I was not expecting a kind of a miracle. But to be honest, uh, when you talked about security and about uh, migration, I haven't heard many new ideas. I'm happy you talk about the holistic approach, an approach that this parliament already decided during last mandate where we clearly talked about asylum procedure, about legal migration, but also about better cooperation with countries of origin to look into their interests to better inform their citizens what kind of chances they have and which not. You clearly talked about legal pathways to better meet our interests in the area of employment. I haven't heard that you are also talking about legal pathways for people who are in need of protection. So maybe you could add something on that. And regarding legal pathways for migration, having in mind the stop in the debates about the blue card, are there already ideas how to overcome that stop in the debate. I also agree with you that return always has been part of our asylum procedure, but of course return is the end of the asylum procedure. First we have to ensure a proper procedure and I would like to know how you would like to ensure that. Also because we have some new ideas, new old ideas, non-papers, including a paper from the German government talking about a kind of um, transit zones at external borders. And I really would like to have some more ideas what you believe precisely how they should look like and how they should be Organized. You also mentioned that there might be no other country to have so many refugees and migrants like Turkey, and I think that's totally not true. Compared to their citizens, I think a country like Lebanon has taken even more migrants on board, and there are many African countries who have and are hosting a bigger number of refugees than Turkey. So uh, I think we should not lie. A last point on security. Security is important for all our citizens. When talking about uh, cybercrime, I'm really tired of always listening that cybercrime is so important to fight against because of child sexual abuse. Child sexual abuse clearly is a crime we never can accept. But the real abuse has taken place in real life. We shouldn't forget about that. So police investigation into that is only the last point. So I think we need to become, I'm sorry, Chair, we need to become more better to investigate and even prevent in real life. And we shouldn't take that example as an excuse to totally go into the privacy of all of our citizens. Thank you. Excuse me. In case, in case there's need to remind it every time we open floors, have it in mind. There's at least 20 of you willing to intervene. If we are going to make it in one hour and a half, which is the scheduled time for this particular debate, let's try to refrain ourselves and shoot our questions the sharpest and the quickest possible in two minutes for the coordinators, one minute for the rest. That is a reasonable way to, to, to handle and to have you all on board. Mrs. Sintveld, for the Renew. Thank you, Chair. I'll do my best and very welcome, Commissioner, to your first appearance before this uh, committee. Uh, I'll try and be brief. First of all, on the, the security strategy. Uh, I'd like to say something about the method, because in recent years, not to say decades, uh, the approach has been very messy. Uh, the European Commission would put forward proposals one after the other without the necessary impact assessment, and I would like to suggest to this committee that we never accept that anymore. We're not going to work on any proposal unless it's been accompanied by the required impact assessment. The implementation is pathetic. Implementation is pathetic. Evaluation non-existent. And then, as very often predicted by this European Parliament, a long list of legislative uh, or, or laws, basically, and agreements uh, pushed by the European Commission has been scrapped subsequently by the European Court of Justice. 
Are you going to do better? Secondly, when it comes to security, you say you're going to focus on cross-border issues. But if you look at one of the deadliest scourges of this continent, it's domestic violence. Two and a half thousand to three thousand women every year die in domestic violence. I haven't seen any marches, I haven't seen any grand strategy with billions dedicated to fighting domestic vi violence. If you really want to save lives, you know, this is, this is a topic. What are you going to do about that? On the Migration Pact, you and, and, and Commissioner Johansson on, are on a listening tour of the capitals. Well, that's wonderful. The European Parliament, however, is a legislator. We have taken position, we have negotiated in good faith with the Council, and now we are in a situation where the Council says, oh, you know, well, we don't know really what it is that we want. Uh, and then you're going on a listening tour of the capitals. Why don't you come to the legislator and see what we have done already? Because I don't think that we should accept that the legislative work that we have done with the support of hundreds of millions of European citizens will just be discarded like that. We will not accept that. And then finally, um, you are now the commissioner, no longer for the protection of the European way of life, but the promotion of the European life, way of life. Okay, I can see that makes you very happy. We call you our favorite lifestyle coach in the European Union. Um, you know, I would like to hear from you, how are you going to protect us from internal threats to the European way of life? That means our values laid down in Article 2 of the treaties. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Now, it'll be for the Greens. Yes. Thank you. I would also like to congratulate Mrs. Kinas because we see him here now for the first time with his appointment. And um, I would like to underline uh, uh, the, the urging uh, uh, message of Mrs. Innetveld to comply with the institutional agreement to come up with uh, impact assessment when there is significant uh, 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 impact uh, of, of certain legislation and also to comply with the obligation to release evaluation reports in the way that is provided in our legal instruments. And I hope that uh, Mr. Skinas is uh, willing to commit here this evening that he will do so. Then I have a question on asylum. Um, uh, the, the priority of Mr. Skinas is to find consensus on asylum with the member states together with Johansson. And then, therefore, it was as a surprise for me that not that the first visit was Greek island, but the second visit was Turkey instead of the capitals of the member states. So um, that was surprising, uh, but of course, many Syrian refugees uh, are depending on a hosting policy by Turkey. Their country is not only destroyed, but Assad has also regained control, and many refugees fear for his policy and for revenge once they would need to return. Now, despite this, as we all know that Erdogan has threatened one and a half million Syrian refugees to deport them to northeast Syria, to a so-called buffer zone, and it may be silent now, but Erdogan is still continuing with preparing the deportation of those Syrian refugees. And therefore, I have a few concrete questions on that. What did you exactly agree with Erdogan? Do you consider the buffer zones as a safe place where Syrian refugees can be returned? Can you guarantee that Erdogan will not send Syrian refugees to northeast Syria? And what will be the consequences for the EU-Turkey deal if he will start doing so? And maybe more in general, how exactly will the Commission monitor the human rights impact of those partnerships with migration in third countries? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. For the ID, it will be Honorable Tardino. Grazie, President. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner, you've recently been to Turkey together with Commissioner Johansson, and you highlighted the fact that this was an opportunity to show that the EU considers Turkey to be its strategic partner with whom to cooperate with respect also to the status of candidate countries. However, we think that actually it was the nth time that Europe stood side by side 
with uh, Erdogan and his, uh, the blackmailing from EU money, it's migratory flows that are the basis for this agreement. Uh, there's irregular transits to Turkey. Turkey has been able to cash in on this, and they've decided about opening or closing the border. But you went along to confirm that the flow of money from the EU will not stop. 58 billion euros as of 2002 onwards, and it seems that this state certainly does not respect the European way of life. Now, the new EU package on migration and asylum that you're going to present next spring, this has recognised the failure of the EU to reform Dublin, and I think that's clear for everyone. So I'm wondering, and I'd like to ask you, what are you going to do between now and spring? Are you actually going to be able to present a resolution to the problem, given that uh, today you haven't told us anything. Now, first of all, the border countries, the peripheral countries that are left on their own, and how on earth are you going to be able to make some headway after all, we've been at a stalemate for years? And then the financing. We've asked the European Commission through parliamentary questions to give us details about how European funds given to NGOs are spent, particularly for those operating the Mediterranean. They haven't replied. Do you know what that reply is? Thank you. Grazie, Presidente. Thank you, Chair. Commissioner Skinas, first of all, I'd like to wish you all the best. You are probably the member of the Commission for, in whom I have the greatest hope in terms of the substance, not the form. Now, it seems that it was just enough to tweak the title of your portfolio to quieten people's concerns who were worried about this protection of the European way of life. And now some people thought it sounded a bit military or fascist, as if protecting our way of life, our culture, our legacy of values, as if that were something aggressive vis-à-vis -vis someone else. Well, I think that's crazy, but that's my own opinion. In any case, now that you've changed the word from protection to promotion, I'd like to understand what's going to change in terms of your action. I hope you're not going to say that nothing will change, because can I remind you that the support given to you on, on the part of certain parliamentary groups was actually dependent on the change of name... Now, there are still doubts remaining about the competence, in particular with respect to immigration. I still haven't understood where the delimitation is between you and Commissioner Johansson on the area of immigration. Now, maybe you'll agree with me that legal and safe immigration is the first victim of illegal immigration. But do you really intend to combat illegal immigration? I'm referring in particular to economic migrants, which is obviously a very thorny issue. And finally, on Turkey, now, I'm not going to continue to put finger in the wound. Now, it seems to me that the visit to Turkey was really the wrong sign to a partner that is unreliable and very aggressive. Now, for Gue, it will be Cornelia Ernst. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, um, hello. Ich würde uh, uh, good evening. First of all, Mr Skinas, I'd like to know from you, you said that you wished to work with Madame Johansson in terms of coordination of the migration and asylum package. What does that actually mean? What do you wish to coordinate? Do you mean coordination of travelling around the member states? What about in Hungary, whether three asylum seekers should be taken on there, or in Poland? How do... How is this going to look? And then how do you want to deal with us? It's very important for us now. In the last Parliament... Two-thirds of us adopted a Dublin 4 proposal, which is progressive and which means that 
all uh, EU states also at the borders uh, are going to have a progressive situation. What's the situation? Are you looking at that? Or are you going to come up with something completely different? So how are you going to deal with us? And then, your proposal of coordination, what about the individual right to asylum according to the Geneva Convention? Is that a part of that? You've only spoken about returns, or is that not particularly relevant as far as you're concerned? That's my first question. Secondly, you talk about evaluation. Cross-border crime has to be evaluated. Are you also evaluating crime against refugees in our external borders. I know in Croatia and Bosnia, I've actually seen for myself it's hell there. Now, the refugees have all sorts of things taken away from them, their money, their phones, their jackets. They are chased away. Now, are you going to investigate these crimes? Thirdly, what about financial money of means that go to Turkey are going to look at where it actually goes. Is there some kind of oversight? Do you have any influence? Do you know exactly where the money is going to Turkey? And finally, you've not said a word about resettlement. We've got to talk about resettlement. How is this going to pan out? How do you imagine this? Please, can you say something more about that? Now, I suggest that we go right away. For the sake of the timing, I think that's the best way forward to have you all on board. But please try to refrain to one minute, to one minute. Okay? Make it in one minute, because there's more than 20 of you, and there's surely need for Vice President Skinas to properly respond to the questions that have to be raised. Okay? We get started by Mrs. botzenberg Ronidi. The floor is yours. Thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to exchange views with you for the first time. Well, I'd like to wish you the best of success on your portfolio. You have a lot of responsibilities, a lot of uh, uh, areas under your wing. We have heard quite a lot of uh, criticism of your visit to Turkey. Personally, I must say that I think that that was absolutely necessary as I see it, we sh would even have asked you to do that. When you say we want to cooperate efficiently with Turkey, particularly on the issue of migration, then, of course, we do actually have to speak to them. But I have a more direct question for you. What would happen now with the EU-Turkey deal, given the fact that your vice president has quite clearly stated that this is the deal is no longer being uh, maintained, uh, that, that there's been provocative actions from uh, Erdogan that would count as a breach of the agreement. Okay, one minute. Señor Moreno Sánchez. Sí, gracias, Presidente. Estilo... Thank you. I'll be very brief. Welcome to you. I very much appreciate that you're here today, Commissioner. Thank you for your presentation. Now, what can the Commission do to change the perception in certain countries of migration? It's not a threat. It's not a problem. It's a challenge. It's a necessity and it's an opportunity. Up to now, the Commission has focused in particular on the more negative part, on coercion, on returns, control at borders, the fight against smugglers. But what can you do in the more positive part of migration? Legal migration, which directives can be introduced, circular migration, that's very important. Integration of migrants. And what do you think about a an idea that's already on the table, that we have a European fund which local authorities would have access to, so the mayors of cities for their programmes? And then finally, I'm wondering about unaccompanied minors. We've got to work on that. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations, uh, Vice President. Two quick questions on migration. Uh, within that pact, you have two very difficult balancing acts to perform. One internally between solidarity and responsibility, and I'm sure you're well aware of that, and one externally when you'll go to third countries to uh, convince them to take returnees uh, on legal pathways. And you've mentioned it yourself, 
But my question is about legal migration, labor migration offers that third countries expect. How will you convince member states to actually give you more, more than that, what they have done so far? You mentioned pilot projects. Uh, pilot projects haven't really delivered a lot. Symbolically, they look good, but we have 15, 20, 30 places in each of the offers of member states, which is by far not enough. The second question relates to 5G. Who is taking up the work that was done by uh, Commissioner King so far, and what will be your next steps on 5G, and do you consider that uh, the train has left the station in terms of what some of the member states have already done? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Madam Kanko, one minute. Thank you very much, President. Um, Commissioner, thank you for joining us and for stressing these important issues. You recently held what you described as a constructive round of talks with Turkey in Ankara. Turkey is, of course, hosting the largest refugee population in the world. There, there are figures from UNHCR from 2018, so I must unfortunately contradict my colleague from SND about that Turkey is really the one hosting the highest, um, the largest refugee population in the world. And have played an instrumental part in controlling the migration crisis. Following this trip, you reiterated the EU's commitment to continuing its engagement and cooperating with Turkey as a candidate country and as a key strategic partner and neighbor, something Erdogan himself has spoken negatively of. However, do you believe this is realistic when only a few weeks ago it was threatening to, quote, open the gates to Europe for refugees and asylum seekers if we did not allow them to proceed in Syria the way they wanted? That's not how friends and partners act towards one another. When building a new migration pact, how much do you believe we have to take into account the volatility of the actions of those on our external borders? And finally, do you believe that a country like Turkey could ever be a member of the European Union? Mr. Finas, part of protecting the European way of life and our values is understanding that Europe is also about solidarity, trust and credibility, perhaps something to keep in mind when negotiating with Turkey in the future. Thank you. Make it in one minute, otherwise we're in trouble. We're all in trouble. Make it in one minute, please. Mr. Ressler, floor is yours. Thank you very much. Mr. Tsimas, uh, you definitely have a really uh, broad portfolio, but uh, I want to focus only on migration. And uh, although this issue is also quite extensive, and uh, we certainly need to look at the uh, possible legal pathways, sustainable mig migration flows, and cooperation agreements with uh, all the countries on the route, but also uh, on the, in the root cause of uh, migration. We definitely have to do more also in uh, fighting illegal migration and smuggling. And uh, currently, uh, at the external EU borders, we are having uh, strong uh, migration pressure. And my question would actually be, uh, could you please expand a bit on what would be the Commission strategy for supporting countries on EU external borders, and especially how would you recognize the differences between different uh, migratory routes? Thank you. Madame Guillaume, a minute. Oui, merci. Uh, si vous... Yes. Well, if you're proposing a new pact to us, that suggests that the previous package, plan, or whatever was not a success. And if it wasn't a success, it was blocked in trilogue. And that's because the member states blocked it. And if I continue that line of logic, well, it's basically because some countries don't want to have any migrants. So what's your intentions? You're talking about withdrawing the proposed Dublin text, but to replace it with something else. But if the position of the member states prevails and the parliament doesn't, then you've got to replace it with a uh, system of redistributing migrants from the external border. That's what I'm guessing. Would you confirm that? So, uh, uh, some member states consider these migrants should not enter. They are put into waiting zones. They are put in closed centres. And basically, they can't be uh, given asylum, but they're basically going to be expelled. Could you confirm that? The general policy is to have these closed centers. 
And uh, I do wonder if that is in line with international law. Monsieur le Commissaire. Yes, thank you very much, Commissioner, and congratulations. Two questions. The European texts on the European asylum law, well, these are currently not being applied in the same manner in each member state because these are considered to be under national prerogative as law and order issues. So uh, will your commission uh, update the current rules? As for the relationships with the countries of origin and other partner countries, could you tell us a little bit more about your joint work on this issue t together with the High Representative, Mr. Borrell? He said they felt a stick. One minute. Mr. Breyer for the Greens. <laughs> Mr. Commissioner, I've been uh, listening very carefully to what you've said on the security strategy that you're going to propose to us, and I'm concerned because of past experiences that it will turn out to be a surveillance strategy rather than a security strategy. Uh, you know, the argument usually goes um, past legislation uh, wasn't effective against crime, so let's have more of it. And I don't think this is very satisfactory. Um, there is no evidence that we would live any safer in a surveillance state, so please be very careful when proposing this new paper. Now, the European Court of Justice repeatedly annulled legislation to record private information on our communications without any suspicion, data retention. And um, I would like to know from you, do, does the Commission have any intention to make a new proposal on data retention? And secondly, with a view to your recent visit in Turkey, can you update us on the state of play of negotiations on the exchange of personal data between Europol and Turkey? Thank you. Mrs. Daly. Thanks, President. I have to say I was a little bit disappointed at the lack of detail in your uh, opening remarks and a little bit concerned at your sort of servile attitude to Turkey. Um, I mean, your statement that nobody has done more than Turkey in terms of refugees, unless you meant the role they played in making people refugees in the first place by opening up their borders and allowing people to go in to Syria in an attempt at regime change there. But you then followed up that statement by saying that you're going to ensure an enhanced role for Europol. And again, like my colleague, in that context, I want to know on your recent visit to Turkey, did you discuss the exchange of personal data with Turkey? You're aware that this parliament has uh, huge problems with that in terms of definition of crime and definition of terrorism. There has been no impact statement. And we hear that negotiations are at an advanced stage, but we haven't had any detail on that. I think that's absolutely critical. And in terms of online disinformation and that aspect, I mean, online disinformation really is being turned into, uh, I suppose, speech that challenges the world views of those in authority. And where, where do you draw the line between, I suppose, protecting people and uh, surveillance and sort of uh, um, censorship? Mr. Sikats. Yeah, yes, thank you very much. A follow-up question on the subject of internet crime. Uh, the this topic was already touched upon by the S&D group colleagues, but there was a report on Interpol about Internet uh, crime, which was, uh, gathered a lot of interest in uh, the Libe Committee. The Internet has made uh, the sharing of child pornography very uh, widespread and easy, particularly the marketing and monetizing of this. So Interpol is already doing a very good job so my question, Commissioner, is how can you continue to optimise this work and support Interpol fully? Thank you very much, Chairman. And thank you very much as well to the Vice President for his explanations. Now, as well as the... I, I, as well as needing migration for our labour markets, as my colleague Javier Moreno has underscored, I'd like to ask you what specifically is your new focus to move the Migratory Pact forward? Now, what is clear to me from my discussions with Member States is that we cannot allow this to fail. However, an easy way then to avoid failure is to abandon any ambition to move away from the Parliament's proposal, accepting the minimum common 
denominator from the council, but I think that's unacceptable. And for that reason, I'd like you to explain to us exactly what kind of dynamics then have flowed from your discussions with member states. A minute. Yeah, vielen Dank. Yes, thank you very much, and congratulations. I'll be speaking German. I just wanted to say that over the last week, uh, specifically on Thursday, there was a video published by Spiegel magazine in Germany showing that pushbacks are taking place in uh, the rear Ev Evros. And it seems that the Commission is just not really answering questions about this. Are you going to continue the policy that you are remaining silent on this, or are you going to stand up for the rule of law? We also know that the situation on the Greek islands is not particularly good. Shameful, I think, would be the right word when you actually have a look at what's going on there. But there are people who give uh, hope, like Salam Adin, who uh, started Team Humanity. But he has been put before the courts on false accusations. On the 24th, he was finally released from prison. He was accused of lots of things that he was not guilty of. Now he's back in prison. He was supposed to be a danger for the public uh, security and he's going to be uh, deported. But if you want to promote the European way of life, maybe you should be promote, helping him. Or will you, do you not intend to intervene in that case? Thanks, Chair, and thanks, uh, Mr. Skinas, for joining us today. You surely are aware that some member states, and more precisely Spain, have recently passed legislation on online contents, and we are quite a bit worried on that. I know that uh, you will surely say that it's too early, but I would like uh, to ask you about your views on the next steps on online content regulation from a security perspective, whether you think that uh, a legislative action is really needed, what do you intend to do to step up uh, the efforts to make the web safe, if this is ever possible? Whether you think that uh, the current rules, including the prohibition of general monitoring of private actors, are obsolete? And of course, what do you intend to do to make sure that freedom of speech and information, which include uh, the freedom to receive and import and impart information and ideas without interference by public authority and regardless of frontiers, is respected? Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Weimars. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, Commissioner Skinas, uh, thank you for your elaboration here tonight. Uh, one of the things you said that I truly welcome is the focus on organized crime within uh, the security strategy. And uh, uh, I also noted that you, you have gone on tour with my uh, with my fellow Swedish colleague Ulva Johansson, and I'm sure you will you, you will have very uh, important uh, discussions with counterparts there. But one thing you may miss uh, when you don't go to smaller places around Europe is the. Uh, everyday experiences of everyday people, such as uh, the mother at my uh, child's kindergarten who told me that her family was victim of uh, auto parts theft as well as burglary in broad daylight, uh, victims of organized crime. And uh, uh, my question would be, what shall I answer her next time she asks me, what does the EU do to address my problems? Thank you. Thank you. Honorable Roberti, un minuto. Prego. Yes, two questions for you, Commissioner Schinas. On the subject of migration, you talked about struggling against the people smugglers. So how can the Commission support the struggle against people smugglers? In the central uh, Mediterranean, are you going to be uh, re-establishing the operations or not? Second question on security. You talked about energy, transport and health as being uh, value-added for security. I agree with that. But what about international corruption? International corruption has a direct impact on our citizens' security. So uh, you should also remember the link to criminal organization who use corruption. It's a security challenge. So what do you think the Commission should do to try and incentivize the fight against corruption at the national level. Mr. McGid, one minute. Thank you very much. Mr. Skinners, there is no country in Europe where anti-Muslim hatred and Islamophobic attacks are not growing. Stemming from the rise of far-right extremist movements, demagogues and fascists projecting a narrative of hate and fear. 
When I read your mission letter, I was honestly baffled to find out that while you intend to fight against anti-Semitism, which you most definitely should, there wasn't a single reference to Islamophobia. Yet your role in coordination of the EU future migration and security related policies represents a unique platform for changing the narrative to break the rampant Islamophobic narrative which synonymizes migrants with terrorist threats. My time in the Parliament might almost be over, and this is why I'm asking you, will you have the political courage to openly counter anti-Muslim hatred in your work as Commission Vice President, dedicating the necessary focus and resources to make sure that the European way of life does not leave anybody behind? Thank you. Right on time. Senor Bouchade, Senor Bouchade, un minuto, por favor. Sí, gracias. Thank you. No speak Spanish. Thank you, Commissioner for your presentation and congratulations on your appointment. Very briefly, my colleague has talked about Islamophobia and in fact I wanted to raise a problem that we also have in Europe which is an attack against the European way of life and that is the attacks against Christian communities. That's happening in Europe as well. Secondly, yesterday one of the NGOs that collects migrants from Libya to Europe open arms said in a tweet that they're now going to go to the other side of the coast. Now, what do you want to do to avoid the NGOs being involved? And who then is going to defend the European way of life? Does the Commission have a plan to help the states in birth rate policy? Because... It might be that within five years' time, there's no one defending the European way of life. One minute. Mr. Skinners, like you, I recently had the chance to travel to your beautiful home country, Greece, and I also went to the Greek hotspots. And so we both really know what the situation looks like. But just to paint the picture, it looks like thousands of people sleeping and freezing out in the open around the camps, uh, lacking basic access to shelter, food, adequate medical care, and even sanitation. So my question to you is here once again, as I asked Commissioner Johansson last week and didn't get a sufficient answer, will you bring the EU countries together and evacuate the most vulnerable people, including over 1,200 unaccompanied minors? Will you fight to improve the living conditions now in the camps and not by senselessly building more detention centers? On the islands, I saw people from across the world fighting for the dignity of these human beings stranded on the islands for years now, a fight that should be our fight. Are you willing to fight for these people? Okay, thank you. And now, Honorable Bartolo. And that will be the final floor, if I'm not mistaken. I'm not missing anyone. Honorable Bartolo. Commissioner. I was wondering if the Commission has actually looked into the consequences of demographic decline in Europe. If you're looking at the scenarios through to 2050, well, the impression that I get is that this is a long-term problem that we prefer to ignore. When we're talking about legal immigration channels, we only ever talk about highly qualified workers. But, Commissioner, isn't it also true that Europe also needs other kinds of workers as well? In the debate, there's been referral to uh, the famous non-paper. Don't you think that the document on the table is basically focused on returns and repatriation? I mean, uh, the aspects linked to your own country, in particular Greece, only talk about returns. I think we have completed the list of those who wanted to make their points, raise their questions, address their concerns to Vice President Skinas. Now, if you allow me, Vice President Skinas, I think you're perfectly going to make it. We still have some half an hour to go before the following track in this order of the day, which is quite busy. We're having Commissioner Reinders and Minister Tupilainen in order to uh, address rule of law relevant points on Hungary, Poland, and Malta. So I suggest, if you allow me, Vice President Skinas, that you do, do, do your very best in order to 
try at least devote a single thought, a single word on every question that I've been raised, because I know it's, it's, it's not an easy task, because I think the worst choice is simply ignoring some of them and, and, and you know, some kind of nurturing the concern that has already been expressed. So do your best in order to at least, at least commit yourself to somehow delivering writing additional comments as to those points that you are not in a capacity to fulfill for the half an hour to go, which is the left time for this uh, initial part of the order of the day. The floor is yours. Thank you all. Thank you, Chair. Thank you all for your uh, questions. I, in, in previous lives, I always followed LIBE uh, closely. As, as an observer, but as an informed observer. And um, I had reasons to do that, because most of the things that have been debated here, sooner or later, were becoming issues that um, came across uh, the policy departments in which I, I had the occasion to work. So uh, I salute the, the vivacity and the life uh, uh, style of debates that shapes this committee, and I look forward to, to continue to engage with you in this uh, wide range of issues that you have just mentioned. Let me start by the European way of life um, and to the many uh, questions that still, one way or the other, uh, revolve around uh, this uh, notion and also, if I may say, this portfolio, which, as you know, is a new one. This does not exist uh, before, did not exist before. Um, contrary to the attempts by many people to project the European way of life as a, some sort of uh, bulldozer concept that is there to bulldoze everything uh, that comes across, or others who think that this is a binary choice, uh, us against them, I never, never understood this concept in such a way. For me, the European way of life, and I think I had a chance to explain this uh, in our engagement in the hearing, was always something of a mirror. A mirror that represents what Europe today stands for. The way we are, the way we look, the way we live, and the way we want to continue living. We are now less, percent, less than 8% of the global population. We account still for around 20% of the global wealth. And we spend 50% of social spending worldwide. This is the European way of life. So we can very well stay there and say, that's okay. That's a model of society that suits us. Or we can ask ourselves serious questions on how we can maintain this level of achievement over time, how, whether we are able to pass on this success that Europe represents today to our uh, children and grandchildren. So I never interpreted this term as a term of exclusion, of hatred. For me, this was always about inclusiveness. And uh, the question about protecting or promoting in a way uh, has a certain meaning, which I, I can understand, because we, we live in European democracy, and this is something that this parliament asked the president to consider, and she did. I understand and share that for some people, the way that the term, the verb protection, assumes something of an aggression to which we, ans we have to answer back or protect. So the way that we use promotion in something more positive, more inclusive, I'm perfectly happy with that. And I must say that I have bought many books in my life, but very rarely I bought a book because of the title that comes in the first page. I always bought a book because of the author or because of the content of the book. And I would expect that people would judge this portfolio on the author and the content rather than the cover. Uh, still in this uh, 
question because it also pertains to very valid questions on my relations with the commissioners, uh, especially Commissioner Johansson, but also the other commissioners that are involved in these uh, work streams. I must repeat what I said again in the hearing, again in the hearing, that this is, uh, uh, as per my mission uh, letter, a very specific set of tasks that I must require. I must to maximize and optimize the work of the commissioners working in my commissioners group. Uh, this does not mean replacing the commissioners. I have no intention or no ambition to replace the commissioner. But I have every single uh, legitimacy, if you like, also coming from this House, to make sure that we deliver on everything that we promise to deliver. And everything we promise to deliver from migration, security, the pact, cancer action plan, European education area, the skills agenda, these are specific commitments that I have to do with the commissioners, not instead of the commissioners. Now, coming back to the many issues uh, that you have raised, and I have here kept uh, very detailed notes, and I hope that I will not, uh, that they will not betray me. Let me start uh, first with uh, um, security. Um, I think I was very clear when I said that our future security uh, strategy would be a strategy that would address everything that pertains to technological progress, but also to the traditional threats as we have known them. It would be wrong, in my view, to privilege one track at the expense of the other. We cannot do digital infrastructure unless we have meaning meaningful responses on critical physical infrastructure. We cannot do cyber or internet unless we have convincing replies on threats to our ports, to our airports, to our nuclear plants. So all this would have to go together. And the emphasis on cross-border security threats is, I think, obvious, because this is where our legal bases are stronger, this is where we can make a difference also with the member states and the Council, and this is where we can justify the added value of what the EU can provide. I have the fullest of respect to issues like the one mentioned by uh, Sophie Inveld on domestic violence. Uh, I will work closely with Vice President Jourova and Commissioner Reinders on a new uh, gender strategy, which is already announced by President von der Leyen. And uh, it goes without saying that this issue would have to be addressed in this specific context. Uh, the same thing goes to uh, the area of um, violence against uh, rights, uh, victims, refugees, vulnerable uh, populations. This would be addressed. Uh, but I would like to caution against a certain view that it's either digital or physical, that it's either this or that. No, it has to be both and it has to be linked into a single uh, strategy paper. And uh, I think it's reasonable to expect this uh, in the third uh, quarter of, of next year. Now, um, again on security. Um, I do not share the fear that uh, security means surveillance. I understand that there are fears of this being the case, but I think I was very clear that we shall not use fundamental rights as a sideshow when we're putting forward security proposals. We will not do that. I was very clear. I said that this is not an exposed uh, addendum, an exposed annex. It is something that front loads, it's the key that opens security. And I think that we have uh, already uh, uh, sufficient guarantees to make sure that this is the case. Um, then, let me come to Turkey, which is uh, of interest to many of you from different perspectives, all of them fully uh, uh, legitimate and uh, uh, fully uh, valid. First of all, let me tell you that we didn't decide to go to Turkey like this. You know, we didn't pack a suitcase and say, why don't we go to Turkey uh, since we're next, since we're in Athens, why don't we go to Turkey? It didn't work like that. We had an extensive discussion with the, Justice, with the Home Affairs Ministers during the lunch of the Justice and Home Affairs Council, where we repeatedly sounded 
views from the ministers on the usefulness of such a visit, and we got a surprising degree of, of convergence, I would say a quasi-consensus from all member states that this is a visit that would be useful for Europe. Then, despite this, we didn't go without having assurance that our visit would be well understood by our Turkish counterparts. And this happened because President von der Leyen had a long phone call with President Erdogan preceding our visit, in which it was made absolutely clear the context through which, in which our visit would take place. We didn't go there to sort out the overall EU-Turkish relationship, which, as you know, is not at its highest moment. We didn't go to do geopolitics. We didn't go to sort out uh, the war on Syria. But we went to convey three very simple messages that I can repeat here. First, we said, hi, we are the new team. And this may be more important than it sounds, because the degree of engagement with the outgoing team has not been always uh, steady. So I think it was important that they see us as new interlocutors on migration. Two, we thank them, Mrs. Zippelt, because yes, this is the country with the highest number of refugees on earth. Probably not per capita, but certainly the highest number of refugees on earth, according to UNHCR uh, data. And we thank them because we think that they make an effort, okay, with our support, but they provide, they host four million desperate people there. So it's something that I think we should at least recognize to them. And the third thing we told them is, look, we will continue to engage on migration because history, geography, and reality condemns us to do so. And yes, Mrs. Metzola, it is true that whilst we were there, there were zero arrivals in the Greek islands. And when we left, there were seven boats. But this is not a reason to stop engaging. This is a reason precisely to continue engaging in this very specific context of migration management. I repeat, this was not a discussion on geopolitics. It was not a discussion on data. It was not a discussion of the big issues on enlargement, on drillings, these are issues that are being dealt separately, but I think this commitment on, on migration was important, was necessary, and I would say overall it left a perspective open. We do not agree with, Tur with Turkey on the way our free support, the refugee money, uh, is used. They have another uh, perception that uh, this money should be paid directly to the state. As you know, we do not accept this uh, method. We prefer to fund host communities, the UN agencies, and the many NGOs that are involved in this work. We also reimburse uh, health care for refugees, but not upfront we pay invoices that are put to us. So we have this disagreement on the way the money is spent, but on the overall utility of continuing engaging in a post-freed horizon, now that the six billion have been fully committed, I think at the House, at, at, at the Council of Ministers, and I sense also in this House, there is a certain degree of convergence that it would be wrong to stop engaging with Turkey. Now I'm coming to the pact, and the starting point for the pact is, uh, is an argument that I, I uh, it's not the first time that I hear it, and I think I also discussed it extensively during the hearing. By no means this new beginning would put on the side the valuable work done by this parliament. We are fully aware that if there was some progress in the previous attempt, it was precisely because of you. And no, we're not coming here to uh, listen to you as observers or commentators of policy. We're coming to you as legislators because what your work, your work and the successful work that you put into the five of these seven texts is there and will not be lost. On the contrary, this will not be uh, put again, we will not start from scratch, this work will be safeguarded. But 
The starting point would have to be clearly the two fundamental texts in which agreement was not found. Again, this was not your fault, I'm fully aware of that, but objectively, Europe, the Union, failed to deliver the uh, asylum, uh, the Dublin uh, reform and the procedures. So this would have to be at the heart of the new beginning, together with the many other subjects that I mentioned. The idea is that we will put forward a package with things that will make sense to everybody because we need to build a consensus and we need to safeguard a commonality of interest around the pact that prevents some member states to undo it. So we have to build a package and we have to safeguard the package. Now, uh, there are many ideas already being submitted to us in writing. I understand that this House will also submit ideas. All these ideas are, are very uh, welcome. This is the moment where we need this raw material to build the, the final edifice. Um, you see many things circulating, many papers from many countries. Nothing should compel you to think that some of this will be the final decision. The final proposal will be done by the Commission, keeping in mind uh, the need not only for consensus, not only for win-win approaches, but also the need of efficiency. We will not put forward something that would be conducive to an agreement that would be unworkable in practice. And I even take a step further. I think we shall not put anything forward unless through this listening tour and through this talking to everybody, we identify a landing zone on the pact. Why is it is important? Because Europe cannot allow itself to fail twice on this subject. A failure would be a major failure for Europe that would shape the way people view the European <laughs> Union, and this is a risk that we are not ready to take. So we would exhaust every margin of goodwill, of contribution, of input to get it right. And uh, I can probably go a bit further, a step further, and say that we sense from this early round of uh, contact with governments and uh, members here that there is a certain positivity surfacing. Uh, the political atmospherics is different now. This is the beginning of a new cycle. This is a, a fresh beginning. People make an effort to put uh, as much goodwill as they can into this edifice. We have political developments in certain member states that are conducive to an agreement. And um, we hope that when we come to you sometime uh, next spring, we'll come to you with something that makes sense. Now, let's go to some specific issues raised. First, on Brexit. Um, it is clear that uh, security would be one of the key uh, issues in the future relationship with the United Kingdom. Um, security would be, if I may call it like, like this, the vital minimum in any future arrangement, any future agreement with the United Kingdom in the post-Brexit uh, horizon. At the same time, one should not forget that the United Kingdom will be a third country and will not be a Schengen uh, member. So clearly, there will be no depth of relationship that could be comparable to membership. That's clear. But we shall uh, profile the United Kingdom as a strategic partner on security matters and will work to ensure that during the transition period will find the best possible way for the future relationship. Now, on Croatia, we are well aware of these allegations of uh, mistreatment, and we take such incidents very, very seriously. Um, when it comes to Croatia, the protection of human rights 
of asylum seekers and of other migrants, the allegations of use of force by law enforcement officials at the border and of denial of access to the asylum procedures need to be discussed seriously and addressed convincingly. Um, we are in close contact with the Croatian authorities and uh, uh, Commissioner Johansson in, uh, informed me yesterday that she discussed this uh, extensively with the minister, with the Croatian minister, who have committed to investigate allegations of, it, of mistreatment. So this is something that we take uh, uh, very, very uh, seriously. On NGOs, I said during the hearing, and I repeat again, that for us, NGOs are part of the solution. They're not the problem. And we have to make sure that NGO, uh, NGOs who perform commendable work in the Mediterranean, their operations have to be protected, safeguarded, but also implemented within a framework of predictability that allows uh, uh, the management of these situations to be uh, effective and convincing. We had this uh, search and rescue agreement, or mini agreement, if you like, in October uh, in Malta with uh, certain uh, member states involved. This, unfortunately, uh, did not uh, find agreement in the Council. In a way, this is easy to understand because men member states are now expecting for the pact to provide the overall solution. But in terms of search and rescue in the Mediterranean, the work of the NGOs, it is clear that we need a structured solution. We do not need ad hoc situations that have not se uh, uh, helped us in the past and have not made justice to, to Europe. Now, I'm coming to Greece. Uh, I said repeatedly uh, that the situation in the islands is not uh, uh, one that we want to see. I said personally that Moria is, is, is hurting me as a European and as a Greek, but at the same time, I think that we should have the courage to see and say that Greece is standing alone on behalf of Europe, managing an unprecedented uh, flaw, uh, migratory flaw, uh, which uh, without uh, a systemic improvement through burden sharing and enhanced solidarity will never, never provide the adequate solutions. So, uh, we can, from Strasbourg or from Brussels, do diagnostics, but we have also to be practical and meaningful and give them uh, all the solidarity they would need, not only in terms of financial resources and ad hoc arrangements during the crisis, but also in terms of the pact and the reform of the asylum laws, because without a meaningful reform of our asylum laws, Greece and our member states of first entry will never, never be able to cope. Now, on inclusion, integration, uh, I'm hopeful uh, that Europe will do much better on inclusion and integration in the years to come. First of all, because I think that gradually our societies realize that this is a need, a priority. Secondly, because uh, these new Europeans around us would claim the rights that we owe them. Thirdly, because the European Social Fund Plus will now cover, as you know, under our new proposal for the next fin financial framework, the long-term inclusion. So we'll have much more money from the EU budget to address these issues than through the migration funds before that. That would only allow us short-term integration. So overall, I'm very positive on the inclusion side. I still have four minutes, so let me say on Islamophobia, anti-Semitism, and um, the way we go about it, uh, part of my, uh, probably this you don't know because it happened after my hearing, but in the final correction of my portfolio, the equality side, uh, Helena Dalli's uh, portfolio uh, was transferred to, com to Vice President Jurova and the Article 17 uh, dialogue for uh, EU dialogue with the churches and the non-confessional organizations on the fight against anti-Semitism came to me. For me, uh, uh, anti-Semitism, uh, Islamophobia, 
and everything that pertains to uh, hate speech is totally incompatible with the European way of life. I would reverse this argument and say what defines us is precisely that we manage to become societies where these pathologies are something that uh, are unacceptable. I understand and I agree that there is uh, an increasing danger both on Islamophobia and on antisemitism. Uh, I'm determined to activate all measures at my disposal. We will have a regular uh, uh, dialogue uh, with these communities and I would very much hope, including uh, uh, members of this committee, to engage positively, positively in addressing these issues. Vice President Skinas, we thank you for your efforts. <laughs> of course, we, we, we much appreciate that you have fulfilled to your very best the time available, but I understand there will be a quick 30 additional seconds, no more than that, from Mississippi, and 30 seconds back to you. I suggest, I suggest you have in mind there is some supplementary comment, but it will be no more than 30 seconds, please. I know, they, they mix Mississippi and me up all the time. Mrs. Entwell, <laughs> I keep confusing, I'm I sorry. See why. No, just a very, thank you very much for your extensive uh, reply. Just one small remark to something you said at the start about domestic violence, which claims 3,000 victims or more every year, which is mo not a small matter. And you said, I'm going to, to tackle this with the uh, uh, equality strategy. No, no. It's an issue of public security. If there are 3,000 people, women, dead because of violence, it's a public security matter. It's not a gender equality matter. Point taken. <laughs> and just to conclude, let me remind you all that at the beginning of 2020, we are to we take the state of the play of negotiations on exchange of personal data between Europol and at least eight Middle East and Africa countries, especially Turkey, for which written information is awaited from the Commission. We are expecting to have that information in time. Second, we are inviting Vice President Skinas again end of January in order to debrief us on the final track of that EU member states tour in which you are engaging with uh, Commissioner Johansson. That should be concluded by then. And third, Libya coordinators have decided to send a letter to the Commission in view of the Asylum and Migration Pact that will be handled in January. And we will discuss in that. Again, surely there will be time to retake the issue of legal pathways that you have seen is so much important for many of the questions that have been raised. We're expecting the Commission to tackle this issue of opening up legal pathways with the occasion of coming up to the final draft of the Asylum and Migration Pact. But we thank you. I think we have done it in time. Minister Turpulainen from the Finnish Presidency and Commissioner Reinders are awaiting for the turn. We thank so much Vice President Skinas. We thank you for having exhausted the time available. We wish you well and particularly wish you Merry Christmas in case we don't see you no more. Thank you. Before the end of the year. <laughs> Before the end of the year. Thank you so much. Now, 